Ooh. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, I'm, this is, the talk's going to be about contextual integrity, as you can see. And I'm so delighted to be here because I'm absolutely convinced and more and more convinced that the privacy problem that we're all confronting today is not going to be solved by one discipline alone. And the, the only way we will get a handle on it is if multiple disciplines and even within those disciplines, multiple fields will come together and engage. And um, hopefully what, what I strive to do in my own work is to create some sort of bridging between the philosophical and ethical discussion and those two law on the one hand, law and regulation, um, and also uh, technology on the other. And I've, ha I've had really the good luck of working with some fantastic computer scientists, both on the theory side um, and on the more systems applied side. And so I really look forward to engagement. I should say I'm a philosopher, you heard I'm a, a philosopher in my PhD, and philosophers find it to be a failure if you present something and nobody disagrees with you. So <laughs> I, I'm going to try and leave, uh, the hope is that I would leave about 15 minutes at the end of the talk so that we can engage and, and you should please feel free to ask questions and, and debate what I'm saying. Um, I have just arrived from, oops, how do I do that? It's not responding. Where? Oh, oh I, I, sorry, I didn't switch it on. <laughs> Theory of contextual integrity. And I just came um, today, actually last night, from a small symposium that now we have, we've had the second symposium on contextual applications of contextual integrity where I was really delighted to see that people came from different disciplines and brought different methods and we're, we're continuing a conversation about that and pushing out some research and in the talk I'll, I'll kind of wave a hand to some of what we've been doing, some of which I'm involved in myself, but a lot of it, I'm pleased to say, does not involve me. So what was my way into privacy? A lot of philosophers got into privacy maybe in the 60s and so on, because we were, we were this word had been emerging and many people engaged in this question of how do you define privacy my entry was not that. I was a PhD student at Stanford and I was seeing the emergence of many of these technologies. And of course, this is uh, really updated till uh, sort of today. Mine was not that. I was rather interested in the technologies and some of the applications of the technologies that were affecting our lives in all walks of life and particularly interested in those occasions where people said, oh my God, my privacy is violated. Whatever was happening, the freak out that people were having as a result of it, they labeled privacy. So I wasn't so much interested in a philosophical deep dive as valuable as that is into the concept, which is what a lot of analytic philosophers do and it is valuable to gain clarity on terms, but rather I was trying to look at the family of episodes or systems or occurrences to which people responded with this particular freak out and labeling it in this way. So what I've tried to do over the years is to say how do we achieve meaningful privacy? That is to say defining a concept that's true to that experience defining it in a way that we could argue that whatever it is that people were caring about when they said that was worth defending. 
Because sometimes people freak out and you say, stop freaking out, that is not worth defending. But it seemed to me there was something there. And so I wanted an approach, some definition of whatever this thing was, that was not only clear and hopefully rigorous, but also could offer an account of why we should care about it and why we can advocate and protest and have a reason to defend it. And then some of the things that followed was the ability to give it formal expression so that it could, there could potentially be some kind of implementation and enforcement was an added bonus because then potentially we might be able to embed or you know, follow what later has been called privacy by design. And I want to just take a moment to acknowledge, and there are probably even more names, but many of the people who I have worked with over the years, because when I mentioned earlier that I didn't think one discipline is the crown jewels and can, and can solve this problem um, by itself, there are many people, and these folks come from all walks of life, and potentially um, you recognize some of them. So the way I want to introduce contextual integrity to you is to highlight four key ideas. Because, you know, I like to think it's a big and complicated theory. There's a book, you know, if you want to delve into the details, by now there are a bunch of articles where I realize I made mistakes in some of the previous work and then I tried to correct it and amplify and so forth. But the way um, that might be useful is to present you these four key ideas, so that if you're not bothered by the details, you might still find it um, useful to know what these four ideas are. And what I want to also do, so that you can, in addition to knowing the four key ideas, also keep in mind what these compare with, or how contextual integrity as a theory of privacy or as an approach to privacy is differentiated. And in some ways, it's kind of subtly different, and in some ways, it's really different. So this is the main idea, and if you need to leave after this, this is the most important thing for you to remember and take away from this lecture. And that is that contextual integrity or privacy is the appropriate flow of information. And the idea is there's both a positive one and a negative one. The positive one is to say, as we all know, information, data flow, is really important and there's a lot of benefit. <clears throat> it's the way society operates. If you want to live in society, then information about you is going to flow. So, if you want to, if you want to um, protect privacy, you don't want to stop the flow of information. You don't want privacy to mean the same as secrecy, which is the stoppage of flow. You want privacy rather to be the appropriate flow of information. Now, this runs against some of the ways I've heard my computer science colleagues talk about privacy. And I've just spent a, about, I spent about six months at the Simons Institute, and I had really fabulous discussions with many of the theoretical computer scientists there. Often, computer scientists will present a theory or present a tool or present a method, and they'll talk about leakage. They'll say, how do we prevent leakage? Contextual integrity doesn't like that word if you just use it on its own, as if leakage is a bad thing. Leakage is not a bad thing. It's only bad if it's inappropriate. And so um, <clears throat> even some of the privacy engineering community have a principle called data minimization. And contextual integrity um, says that data min minimization on its own is not necessarily a good thing, you need to minimize appropriately. And so if you start off with that idea, appropriate flow, that is where we begin with the definition of contextual integrity. Now, <clears throat> of course you're sitting there and you're like, oh, well, what's appropriate flow? And that now we enter into 
the next key ideas of the theory. One, the, the, and I haven't miscounted, I just want you to know, <laughs> but there's an interesting connection among these four ideas, and um, there are two definitions or accounts of appropriate flow. One is that appropriate flow is flow that conforms with social norms. And in the legal domain, we often hear of things like reasonable expectations of privacy. So when we talk about a norm, I've also come to understand that computer scientists and mathematicians use the term norm in a different way. And a lot of the disagreement and confusion was that I was using the term norm in one way and other, and folks were understanding it in another way. So if you prefer, it could be just a rule. Think about it as a rule. And we, we live in society, there are lots of norms that govern our behavior. We, you know, governing our behavior even at this moment. And some of them are explicit, some of them are embodied in law, so you'll often have a legal rule that embodies a social norm. Sometimes you'll have legal rules that are just legal rules. Sometimes you'll simply have conventions of expected ways of behaving and so on. So one of the claims is, if you, you know, in the early days of Google Maps Street View, there was an outcry because people didn't like the fact that the cameras showed various things and so people objected to it and they said it's a privacy violation and the defenders of Google Maps Street View said, oh, but you know, we only showing things that are public, you know, in public roadways. And in fact, what the, argu the back the argument is, no, actually, the, the, there is a difference in the flow of information that's caused by Street View because you don't now have to be standing in front of someone's house, you can be, etc. And so that particular technology had violated people's expectations and often the expectation that's violated is a signal of a norm, a social norm. And then what um, I will come to later is the fact that appropriate flow, it has a normative content that is like an ethical or prescriptive content that you will often call something appropriate if you think that it's legitimate. And so there, there needs to be an idea in there that also explores appropriateness as a normative concept. So I'm going to concentrate, I'm going to start with this idea, which is that appropriate flow is flow that conforms with norms or rules. It meets our expectations. And you see this little word entrenched, and it's quite an important word, because there are lots of norms, and I'm sure I could, I could um, identify some of them that are entrenched. Their expectation, nobody wrote the rule down, but we behave in ways that we learn, we absorb from society, and those are the norms that I'm calling entrenched, and those are the ones that meet expectation. So if we say appropriate flow conforms with entrenched norms, and what this goes against, those of you who are somewhat familiar with privacy policy are the fair information practice principles which were devised in 1973 and then were ultimately embedded in the first um, Privacy Act of 1974 which was basically a tragedy because although the people, the, the commission in 1973 said here are the fair information practice principles, we need to embody them in an omnibus privacy law what happened instead was that in 1974 the law was passed but it only covered government held databases and it left the whole commercial domain. I mean that was 1974 and people maybe didn't have a sense of what was to come. But anyway, it goes against the fair information principles and something that we're all very familiar with which is the informed consent mechanism and it's, it's often operationalized as notice and choice. And we call that a procedural approach to privacy. 
it says that if you follow these and these steps, then you're going to achieve privacy. And the fair information practice principles, which are really the fundamental of where we are today in privacy regulation. Now, some people may say, oh, there's the US law and then there's GDPR, which is the European um, general data pr protection regulation also still based on fair information practice principle, although they act, they've added some substantive prohibitions into those rules. But it just says, okay, if you present people with a policy and people agree, then privacy is protected. It says nothing about the substance of what the practices are. And a contextual integrity rejects that approach. It says we need to have rules substantive rules about what flows are and are not allowable. So why contextual integrity? And so we're, we're diving a little bit more into the theory itself. My own approach, so you can see entrenched contextual norms, is to think about society not as an undifferentiated social space, but rather as constituted by a whole variety of different social domains. And these domains are oriented around, or you could even think that historically, anthropologically, they emerge around certain purposes, goals, and values. It could be we want to educate young, and what has evolved around that is an educational domain. Or we have health, and what's emerged around that is Domain, a healthcare domain, or there could be a political domain. How do, we, how do we choose our rulers or our leaders, our political leaders, what sorts of powers they have over us, and so forth. And, and it's so that although, although I personally had done a lot of reading in the areas of social philosophy and social theory and so forth, I wasn't, I didn't hang the theory of contextual integrity on any one particular, but there's a lot of social theory that um, constructs society in this way as constituted by these different domains. Now, this is number three. What we're saying is that these contextual informational norms and information, is a, it, information flows or practices or policies com conform with, if they conform with entrenched social norms, we say that these flows are appropriate. What contextual integrity goes on further to say is that here is the structure of the rule. In order to formulate a rule correctly, a well-formed rule for the purpose of knowing whether privacy is preserved, and I feel like this community maybe understands this idea better than many communities that I, I try to talk to about this, is that you need to provide values for these five independent parameters, or like three depending on, on, on how you count them. Actors, and so just for short, this is the CI tuple, Someone told me that this is how you say it. And it's actors, information type, transmission principle. So when you're describing a practice and you need to figure out or assure someone that this is appropriate, this conforms to it, contextual integrity, you need to specify the sender, the subject, the recipient, what, what the type of the information is and the transmission principle. And I'm going to say a little bit more about all these different parameters, but I wanted you just to see one quick example of what the structure that such a description or, or a rule might look like with all the parameters filled in or values for all the parameters. So here are um, an assortment of the, the, now, let me just say this, that often the subject and the sender are, the, are one and the same, and so it might seem like there are only four parameters listed, but in fact, 
you know, you have that ident uh, the, the two identified and so it's not a problem. So these are contextual informational norms. The values for the parameters are expressed as in terms of roles. So it's people, not just people, it's let's say people acting in certain capacities and the capacities are very much constitutive of the domain itself. So if I say physician, you are going to say, what, what's the domain? What's the context? <laughs> Thank you. You know, it'll be healthcare or teacher, it's education. And sometimes it's mess, you know, I'm not saying it's all neatly tied up, but the, it's, it's not that the context implies the roles, the, maybe the purposes imply the roles, it's that the roles are part of what constitutes a context. Information type is the ontology of attributes and again to some extent they're connected to the identity of the context. And then finally the third thing which is I have to say I think it's a contribution but it also is the most troublesome of the parameters because um, this, and there's lots of work that still needs to be done on it. However, what the transmission principle is, is the constraint under which the information flows. And so what you can see here is that consent is now a transmission principle under this structure. And when you share information with consent, that is the transmission principle. But when you are filing your tax returns, and you have to fill in that thing that says gross annual income, that is not with consent. You, are, you have to, there's coercion, or you're standing in front of a judge, you're a witness, you, you must answer in a, in a certain way, and there's sometimes more complicated um, transmission principles. So for example, the police can't just barge into your house and go searching around, if, you, if you're a suspect, they need to get a, a, a warrant from a judge and then they can enter with a warrant and that is a transmission principle. Often in the privacy domain, people forget about the transmission principle and as we can see with something like with a warrant, that is a critical transmission principle and we depend on that to, to, to be living in a system where law prevails. Okay, so all the parameters matter. Here was one of the excellent ex oops, experiences that I had as I was, I was presenting this. I was part of a large NSF um, grant and I was presenting early ideas from contextual integrity many years ago. John Mitchell was in the audience and he said, oh wow, we." we think we can provide a formal expression of these ideas. So what, what, you've, what, I've, already, what I've shown you is already like digested through a lot of the help that I got from the folks on this paper and there was an Oakland paper that uh, was, was really successful but in sitting with the, these collaborators they would just ask me questions. What about this? What about this? What, what about this? And I think that the, the theory became much more rigorous and precise as a result. But what we see here, which was rather satisfying, is that, um, and this was a lot due to Anupam data, is that if you look at actual law or actual rulemaking in the United States, a lot of the rules, and this comes directly from HIPAA, a covered entity can disclose a patient's psychotherapy notes to the patient only with prior approval fr from the patient's psychiatrist. And so you can see all the parameters being listed in this rule that um, Health and Human Services came up with. And what's, I think I like to present this rule because this shows you that in some cases it's not actually the data subject that determines, fully determines the information flows. So just to pause a moment and say the way this all works is that if you 
if you're interested in analyzing a particular device or a particular system, according to the theory of contextual integrity, what you do is you need to describe data flows. And, and this is quite important and quite practically relevant. And I don't know how many people in this room have developed apps, for example, but we've utilized this just in, in, in very like low-key settings where people are developing mobile apps. And we say, okay, you need to, first of all, map out the data flows and, and, in, and make sure you know you, you're able to provide the values for these parameters. And then, once you have a description of the flows, you can do some comparison to make sure that the flows conform with entrenched norms. Now, just to get back, and I, I'm going to say more about this, but I wanted to now elaborate a little bit more. When we subscribe to the idea that appropriate flow is flow that conforms with entrenched or and contextual rules, we've already said that the most universal approach that this country and GDPR2, but that's a longer story, has taken to privacy protection is through this concept of subject control of information about ourselves. Some of you, I don't know how many of you have been following some of the New York Times privacy project. You know, I think it's a, it's a great series of articles, but we started counting and there are about at least, I stopped counting after 20 of those essays, all end by saying what we need to do is give people control over information about themselves. And then the only way we seem to have to do that is notice and choice. That has a, that's a problem, but I argue on the basis of contextual integrity that saying that the whole arena of privacy is control over information about ourselves is to take control, which is one transmission principle, and make it into the entire domain of privacy protection. And this is highly problematic because, I argue, there are multiple transmission principles and sometimes we actually don't have a right to control information about ourselves. Second, another approach to policy making is to kind of divide the world of information into sensitive information or not sensitive information. And to say, you know, privacy regulation only applies to sensitive information as far as all the rest of the information, anything goes. Contextual integrity says no. Any information, and here's my claim, any information requires norms, or it is bound by norms, of that constrain the flow of that information. It can be something like your name. And we've now done some empirical research that validates that idea. And finally, if you're building some kind of access control system, you need to be thinking about the values for all of the five parameters, not four, not three, not to, so that to argue that, say, we only need to worry about sensitive information is problematic because, first of all, you're only worrying about one parameter. And second of all, instead of looking at the whole ontology, you're, looking, you're just dividing the world into two types of information, end of story. Now, when I say that access control rules have to govern all four, the practical situation is that sometimes access control rules make assumptions about the outside world and it may be that you're not able to represent or model all of the five parameters and you need to make an assumption about, for example, let's say you're building something that's only about men's health, then you don't you may, you may not need to specify, well, I don't know, 
you may need to. But you, you, if, you, if, you, if, it's, if you know that the, the, the system is going to be used within a certain domain and only certain parties are going to have access to, to, to it, maybe through some kind of um, authentication mechanism, then you can get away with using the external device to already constrain, for example, who the recipients are, and then the rules within that system don't need to specify all five. So when I say you need to specify all five, I'm realistic about the fact that sometimes you're not able to represent all of those five within the system, and you need to control some of those parameters outside of the system. And I mean, anybody who's modeled anything knows that it's, it's not just a restriction on this kind of thing. So this is just a slide that says, here is the work that we need to do, having gotten this far with contextual integrity. We need to, you know, I've, I talked a lot about entrenched norms. Some of these entrenched norms are quite intuitive and, and some of them are expressed in law and so we can figure out what they are. But because we're in this domain, so some of the, some of the controversy around surrounding the platforms, for example, or mobile apps, we, we, there's a mess. And some of the more predatory data practices take advantage of the fact that we haven't, we as a society, we haven't really figured, we haven't done research which teaches us what the robust implicit norms are. And so this is really, okay, red, here's the code. Red is what I think is mainly in the, in the domain of social scientists and communication <coughs> scholars and so on. For us to learn more about what our expectations are. And there are tons of studies now, Mechanical Turk is the favorite platform, to try and extract and be more precise about what some of those norms are. The blue is what I think mainly is in the domain of computer science, and it could be systems people or, or security folks, networking and um, theory crypto to um, not necessarily only think about the case, you know, the standard case of Alice, Bob and Eve, but to appreciate, and I'm sure you do, some of the much more complex circumstances. So I, at the moment, um, I'm working with some folks on, on smart or autonomous vehicles. And um, if you think about those vehicle communication systems, I remember way back about a decade ago working with Dan Bonet, who had some really um, clever cryptographic system to say, well, you don't really need to know who the driver is, but you need to be still be able to identify the car uh, for purposes of coordination. And that's, I think, what, you're, what this community is really expert at, is to prov provide ways of constraining information flow that respects the norms, that respects the constraints, while allowing systems to continue functioning, not grind to a, a halt. And then, you know, these other, um, these other activities, the purple, which is the red and the blue together, is ways in which I think it's really important for us to work together on a common problem. Now, if you're thinking about just with the lens of privacy as control, your life is a little bit easier. When you operationalize control, there's just this one thing you have to operationalize, which is giving control. And of course, as we all know, the, the current notice and choice regime is highly ineffective. And we're sitting with this policy because it's very convenient for the information platform providers and other uh, you know, mobile platform providers. It's very convenient because it pretty much allows them to do anything. And what we need is unfortunately more complicated, but I think would give us much better privacy. So some of the work we are doing within our group is empirical studies that question some of the 
ages old assumptions about privacy and I don't have so much time so I'm not going to go into it um, and here's another way uh, we have a platform that tries to um, govern information flow now within an institutional setting so we don't have to uh, take care of all you know a ton of values for the different parameters and there are lot, there's just lots more to do and uh, as I mentioned other people are also doing it. Now I don't know, you know, it's hard to follow a particular talk just if it's the first time you're ever encountering it but there's something that I'm wondering maybe this is really bothering you and that is that the whole reason we're here today, I mean I'm here today, is that is technology and the technology is disruptive. A lot of this technology that we all love or love to hate has disrupted information flows. That's number one. And number two, it may be that we have flows that, sorry, I'm just, that we just don't have norms for. And they're troubling but there, there doesn't seem yet to be common agreement about what the right thing to do is. And so basically whoever is the more powerful or whoever has the neat app is going to be the one that defines the flows and we just sit around passively w hoping that nothing bad is going to happen to us. And there are a whole lot of other reasons why the entrenched approach is problematic. Now I had in early days not actually developed this part of the theory because I was really in love with the idea that you know society has these entrenched norms, we look at the Hippocratic Oath, we've evolved these norms over centuries and there's the wisdom of the ages and you know we should go with that. But you can't be conservative in that way and say no change is possible and everything's a privacy violation if it violates an entrenched norm. So we need some approach to march into this new domain and be able to evaluate not only our own entrenched norms, like slavery is an extreme example, but also to evaluate new practices, new institutions that are being thrust on us, where let's say Mark Zuckerberg is saying, oh, Facebook has changed the norms. And we're sitting there saying, no, You've changed the practice, but what basis, on what basis are you saying that the norm has changed? And so now coming back to our diagram, we're going to look at this number four, because you know, now we have got a number three, which is how do we look at some new practice or even an entrenched norm and evaluate whether it's okay or not? And I use this philosophical concept of legitimate, but it can be something like, is it worth defending? Is it morally justifiable? And contextual integrity offers three steps to thinking about this. And you know, it's, it's, I have just not too many minutes and I'm going to go a, a little bit quickly. The interests, we need to do a kind of economic analysis when we look at some of these new practices and say how, who's harmed, who's, who benefits, standard economic policy analysis. And then there's a discussion of political principles, you know, does this diminish freedom of speech and we've seen a lot of analysis of this in the, in the media, is it biased, does it, does it create unfairness and that's um, the second line but it's really the third line that I want to emphasize which comes directly out of the contextual approach, which is, you know, contextual integrity, which is what I said at the beginning of the talk, is that contexts are constituted around purposes and values. So imagine the Martian landing in a university and sending back the description of what a university is or what a school is. Describes everything that's going on, but doesn't say what we're doing in a university, or what a school is trying to do, the purposes. I think we would all admit that they're missing a major point about these basic institutions of society. 
And so what contextual integrity argues is, yes, you discuss interests. Yes, you talk about some of these very highly abstract values. But what's also important is contextual ends and purposes. And here are just a few. I'm not going to go through them. But I also wanted to show you that this is an intuitive idea. And uh, here in 1925, when tax returns, uh, the, the tax information that we provide to the IRS went from being public information to being information that was now held in enormous confidence as we've been learning increasingly in the past year and a half um, by the IRS. And Andrew Mellon's argument was not like, oh, you know, people have a right to privacy in their, in their tax returns. His argument was, we want people to say honestly what they earn, what they're worth, and that's important so that the treasury can benefit from taxing them. And so one reason why people might want to hide their earnings is because it's being blasted to the world. Imagine, you know, your family, your large family learns that you're really quite wealthy and how many people will come and hit you up for loans and whatnot. So, and he succeeded. That argument succeeded. So we're saying, and healthcare is the same. If, if someone has a, a contagious or infectious disease, may not report for testing, and that's problematic not only for the person, but for social, societal health. And so we insist on very stringent privacy regulation in healthcare in order to promote health and so forth. Now this is, here's the not part of it. This is different from some other approaches who insist that privacy is only about the data subject. Actually, there are two things, and I'm pleased you've, those of you who've stayed are still here. The first really important point to take away is that it's not secrecy, it's a appropriate flow. And the second important point is privacy is valuable not only for the individual but for social integrity as well. Privacy promotes contextual ends and purposes and that's why it's important. So all those times that you hear people say, oh you've got to give up some of your privacy in order to you know, improve health, now that you've sat in this room, you have to reject what they're saying and say no, because an adequate approach to privacy will say that an appropriate flow of information has to be shaped so that it can serve individual interests, but also is well designed if it also promotes the contextual ends. And we've been looking at some examples of that in, in politics and education and so forth. And the third, well, you know, a lot of people who do differential privacy will say, you know, privacy versus utility. And I hope that we can get past that because privacy is not instead of utility. Privacy can serve utility, but you just have to stop thinking about privacy as secrecy as stoppage of flow, but rather appropriate flow. And sometimes that will serve utility. So I wanted to bring up this because many of us have seen these images through the lens of contextual integrity. The sin of Cambridge Analytica was not that this information was shared without consent of the data subjects. It was a problem because it has de because it destabilized democracy. And when we try to solve it, we don't say, hey, Facebook, next time ask people, because you know that 95% of people are not even reading and they're going to just click. You need to think, we need to think about how this is going to affect these deeply valued purposes. So, I mean, here are just a few little examples, which I'm not going to go through. This is my last slide. I can come back to those if you like, but I, I did want to leave some time for discussion. 
The heuristic that we come up with for practical purposes is to discover the relevant norms or expectation, contextual norms or expectation, map flows in terms of the parameters, check conformance, um, and perform a legitimacy analysis. Now, having built the big picture, we still subscribe to what I had said earlier about what contextual integrity needs us to learn to be a functioning theory. And that is that people like myself and legal scholars and so forth, we have to understand the, imp for example, with the Facebook Cambridge An Analytica, we really need to dive deeply into the consequences of these for individual social values and how they affect some of the constitutional laws, in the case of the US, some of the values, the Bill of Rights, to which we're committed to, and presumably different countries and different cultures would have different norms. We need to move beyond this obsession. And I can say that the number of articles that has been that have been written about, you know, let's um, analyze privacy policies and compliance and so forth is, is kind of mind boggling. And I don't think in the end it's going to serve privacy very well. We need, in my opinion, economic and game theoretic methods for figuring out what optimal policies or substantive rules, because sometimes, you know, just very uncreative laws are not necessarily going to give us the appropriate flows that are legitimate and important. And then, of course, I think the, back to the, what we can do in the computer science and um, crypto community is help us figure out smart ways to enforce flow policy, policies and express them um, in technical systems and devices. Oh, I guess that's the end. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Please come to the mics. Yeah. Um, is this on? Oh, okay. Um, so um, it, it's an interesting way of thinking about things, and I, I thank you for the, the talk. Um, the, a problem that we face is um, that we do need control, because although you can talk about appropriate flow, there's a problem of preventing inappropriate flow. That's very hard. Some other complications are the lack of permanence. The rules change. Uh, the data is owned by new people. And the interpretation of appropriateness disintegrates over time. And then there's a, uh, a monotonicity principle. Um, the amount of information that is disclosed about you simply increases over your lifetime. So. Um, I, Maybe it's a secondary part of your theory to address some of these other problems. I'd like to know your views. Yes. yes. No, I th those are all very good points. When um, I talk about control, the main, and maybe I, I wasn't clear enough, I mean control about information about ourselves by the data subject. And what I was objecting to is that where, where we are today for the most part, is that we think that a bilateral agreement between the data collector and processor with the data subject is what privacy amounts to. And the argument here is, first of all, that is not going to be for the benefit of the individual, especially for the reasons that you raise about how complicated the data environment has become. And second of all, because there's the societal impact. And sometimes people don't have a right to control information about ourselves because it's not beneficial for promoting societal ends. And you may disagree with 
me on that score because you may just think that a, on the issues of information about ourselves, it's sort of like nobody's going to tell me who I can marry, for example. It's just fundamentally my choice. Then we just, you know, then we part company. I mean, I'm just responding to some of your points. The question of change is precisely what that second part of the theory tries to address. Because norms also change over time. Circumstances, hurricanes, uh, we become smarter, we become hopefully more ethical. We have to have a system that allows this change to take place. And this is an attempt to give some kind of systematic approach to that. Thank you very much for your talk. I very refreshing, <clears throat> refreshing view and I think much more productive than a lot of the discussions I've seen so far. I'm a bit confused. You seem to focus very much on the flow of data. And to me, the use of data is a much yes. bigger issue than the yes. flow of data. Yes. Maybe yes. you encompass it in the flow, but that wasn't Yes. Good. Yes. Thank you for raising this very difficult, important <laughs> question. So it's, and it's a debate that started out early. The theory describes these norms, which are norms of flow. And the critics of that, even friends, said, Helen, you've got to do something about use. And I said, I don't need to do anything about use. Two reasons. One is that a physician or the role implies use. So in saying physician, we have some implicit assumption about what the physician is doing with that data. And second of all, with, with the, the outcomes of use, we can capture that when we look at the evaluation of the norms, interests, values, and contextual purposes, which was fine until about 10, five, you know, okay, five years ago, when actors, large platforms and, and information services companies really blossomed and became these global giants and accumulated data from all walks of life and didn't think twice about just pulling all this data and we didn't know what they were. You know, we, they didn't have a fixed role. In 19, I don't know when it was, 25, 85, <laughs> there was the Telecommunications Act in the United States and they th define the role of a telecom provider. They say, this is what it is and by the way, here is how we're gonna regulate your <clears throat> data flow. You can't record calls. You can listen to a few snatches for quality of service. You can record metadata. Well, I'm just calling it metadata. And so they stipulated that. But we're living with this. And the problem here is that <clears throat> these, because we don't know these parties, <clears throat> they're just using the data in multiple different and I'm thinking non-contextual ways. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. And so I now agree we need to have use. That's a long mm -hmm. answer, but yes, I think we now have to have a use parameter. And how are we going to, and I'm working with people, I mean, how are we going to do it is an issue. Yeah, I actually think that a lot of your theory just applies to both things, and maybe we kind of talk about flow, talk about processing of data, <clears throat> uh, encompassing both the use and the flow, or you can define the flow within an organization, but that's very easy to misunderstand. Yes, and, and how to do it is still something <clears throat> that I'm thinking of, but because of where we are today, we need to have a use parameter. Thank you. Thanks. So actually, to just to follow up on that, that was actually some, one of the things I wanted to bring up. So first, I very much appreciate your, your, your perspective. I think it's great to think about it as flow, as, as a contextual thing, and to think about data as something that doesn't necessarily belong to one person or another. You know, with, uh, it's, it, it, it's the right way to think about it. Uh, but so use is, so I think the use is two, at least two different components that have to be addressed. One is the aggregation of data. The, 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 you know, the whole is much more than the sum of the parts. And as you say, all this, uh, you might, and, and the, uh, 
And, and the no theory will be, may be meaningful without addressing that. Yeah. And as practice showed us. Yeah. And, uh, and the other thing is that the flow of information should be thought of as circular, right? Because it also comes back to us. It's yeah. not just what flows away to us, but from us, what <laughs> comes to us, right? When I've been shown ads that have, yeah. you know, biased or whatever, yeah. that's not what coming out is what's coming in. And, right. and the whole thing is one big ecosystem that cannot talk about one without the other, it sounds to me. Yeah, so I won't address the coming in part, <clears throat> but I do want to um, mention two things. I have an article, if anyone's interested, it's called Contextual Integrity Up and Down the Data Food Chain, mm -hmm. where I look at um, how we have a, a, adapted to certain this problem that you mention, everyone, you know, doing machine learning and so forth is, is really relevant, um, that sometimes we can adjust norms to learn from what we see. So I think we were <clears throat> very good about social security number back in the day because we saw that that accumulated a lot of information around it and then we could do all sorts of things and then suddenly, you know, Everybody was asking, what's your social security number? Stop, because we realize how, how revealing that was. However, I think we're moving at such a speed. So in the cases where the norms can't catch up to the practices precisely because of what I'm calling the, the data food chain, we need to then, I mean, I think their flow won't help. We need to go directly to purposes. And we need to say, is it worth it that companies are surveilling every move we make online and now increasingly with smart cities and that in physical space? Is it worth it so that I can get an ad that even if I'm interested in it, expose myself to this entire system? And that's the kind of question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to do that if it's going to stop plagues, maybe so, but we need to do it responsibly. We need to have that discussion of what's worth it, and I don't think we are yet. Thank you. My question is related to the information processing okay. issue, um, and I'm just wondering how you deal with uh, rules that might be just contradictory to each other. So you can imagine that we think it's okay for information X to be released to someone and we might also really not want information Y to be released without realizing that Y can be inferred from X. Yes. So how you would uh, address that yes. kind of issue. And, and I mean, <clears throat> this is where having the additional, I, I can't, you know, it's a big problem and one of the issues about having these platforms that are gathering, you know, information 360 degrees with just no, no, uh, we have this political economy of information at the moment, which is basically, if you own it, you can do what the heck you like. So you can uh, you know, buy a, a blood processing lab, and you can be talking about a consumer practice, and there's no sense that there actually should be rules, even within single ownership, that stops that kind of processing and merging of the information. I mean, it's sad because we've kind of, it would take a lot of rhetorical force to push the dial back a little bit. So, but, but there's a little help you can get from the extra parameters, you, and that, which is to say, I'm prepared to give X to A and Y to B, but I know that if they merge this data, like data brokers, we have a problem. And if we think contextually in terms of ends and purposes and values, I think we can protect against some of it, but not all of it. So, thank you. I don't know. Yeah, oh, you, yeah you were next. Um, really interesting talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, one, of the, one of my questions, though, and perhaps it's because I'm misunderstanding, when, when you talk about the attributes, the sender, the recipient, and the subject, and especially with your example on the psychiatrist, it, it didn't talk about the data origin. Yeah. So in, in that particular example, the psychiatrist was the, the origin of the data. 
mm -hmm. and so clearly should have controlled <clears throat> the notes. Yeah. So I'm wondering why data origin isn't part of those right. attributes, because in some cases, right, it's method collection and, and other things that are being protected by the data origin. Yes, and I do think that um, there is a um, kind of this leading way in which we think about data as like just stuff lying around that people go and gather when in fact data is very much a construct. And strange you should say it, but we had a, a small DARPA grant with a few of us and we started talking about origin. It may not satisfy you, but if you, if you look for that, I think we had a publication, I think it's out already, but we did talk about, it's not to say that the originator necessarily sort of owns, but that the originator of the data is a relevant question to ask and can affect the flows. So, I mean, that's all. I, I think you're right. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So thank you for your talk. I was wondering, we were discussing how um, contextual integrity chooses not to see society as one cohesive whole, I think in your second point. I was wondering how this interacted with the lawful side of things. Does it, for example, advocate that different groups who have different norms about appropriate data flow should be subject to different laws? Because it seems like that could be rather uh, a bit of a Pandora's box. Um, I'm not, I didn't hear every word you said, but I'll try answer and then you can tell me if I got it right. <clears throat> this is an interesting question because um, many people will say that Europe is much more advanced in thinking about privacy than the US because they have this kind of omnibus, om, omnibus approach to saying we're going to have one regulation, like one size fits all. Actually, it also devolves to something called um, purpose binding and, and, the, and purpose can sometimes map onto what I call contextual. In the US, we have what's known as the sectoral approach, where we do in fact have, they're just bad. The, the problem is that they're bad, but the general idea of having a slightly lower level but more specific set of regulations for some of the major um, domains is, I think, important. And the reason it is is that someone like myself, who's a privacy theorist, don't come and ask me what the rules should be for finance or for healthcare or for education. The people who are writing those rules need to be experts in those domains. So that's sort of to put the positive spin on, on thinking of society. And law does it too. Law, there's commercial law, there's, there's private law, there's public law. So even though we have the Constitution that has some very high level abstract values that where the other laws really need to, you know, because you challenges to laws based on conflicts with the Constitution, I think of privacy rules as a little bit like that. And I would like to see those sectoral rules improved a lot and not always have this little switch that says, these rules hold blah, 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 except if the data subject gives permission for something else, which if you look at all the laws that we have on the books, has this weird exception. Probably not in some of like national security regulation. I'm just curious about something which was on uh, one of your slides. So what's the problem with the number of spoons in your coffee? What's what? <laughs> Since were, uh, in one of your slides, there was a problem of uh, transmitting the number of spoons of sugar in your coffee. What's the problem about this? You mentioned spoons of sugar in the coffee. What's the problem? I did? What else did I do that I, I... Actually, it was just before the sexual orientation. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> wow. I think I was saying, this was in this 
do you mind that I'm just doing this kind of thinking? Which is, I wanted, I wanted in the work in which I challenged this dichotomy of public and private, I was arguing that there's information that's personal, because I said like there's actually many different dichotomies, and there's information that's personal, there's information that may be sensitive, and, but that was before I went on and said actually, actually there are these contextual ontologies. Something like how many spoons of sugar you have in your coffee, you could say is personal. But it's not sensitive, unless it's a health insurance company, in the sense that if somebody learns it, you could face harms. And uh, this was early argumentation against the claim that you can divide the entire world into the public and private. I'm sorry, I just blanked on that one. Yeah. Um, I think you're not addressing the real problem. This is the, 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 the this is the deck chairs on the Titanic problem. Um, you know, we're asking detailed questions, and the, the boat's taking on water, and we need we need to address Zuckerberg. <laughs> But how? You know, how, how are we going to do it? Because we're a country of laws. So we need to provide the way in. With the, Cambr the reason I use that Cambridge Analytica case is that I want to excite people into realizing that it's not just a question of me personally controlling but actually what some of the companies are doing, and, and Facebook is very visible, but I think data brokers are a case in point. The mobile operating systems, I mean, there are quite a few companies that are in this space. Their data practices can undermine democracy. Now, if, if, if our regulators cannot respond to that, I think that that's, that's a problem. And, and that's the sort of thing we need to communicate because that will get us the foot in the door. Anyway, thanks for. Yeah, I know, go for it. Congratulations, so I hear a round for this barbecue.